Let's introduce the sentence of interferometry. This is kind of a tricky thing. Here's how it works. Let's just consider two telescopes to start. You suppose it's looking at something off in this direction. And the waves are coming in from space. Hits this telescope first. And I'll try to draw these in phase here. So it's uh, low, high, low, high. It hits this telescope first, but because of the distance between them, distance d, this has to go through some more oscillations. Maybe it's an even number, maybe it's a fraction. These signals are turned into electronic signals. The radio waves are detected and controlled electronically. And those signals are brought together and they're mixed. So basically the idea is if they're in phase, they'll add together into something even stronger. If they're out of phase, they'll add together into nothing. So as the star moves across the sky, sometimes between the two telescopes it's in phase, and then out of phase, then in phase, and out of phase. And you observe in this strange frequency space, or periodicity space, measuring the times and distances on the sky between it being in phase and out of phase. And then through some pretty complicated mathematics, you can take that information and go back and make a picture. It's not easy, it's not point and shoot. Uh, with two elements here, you're getting some information on that particular scale, but you can imagine if I change the distance between the two telescopes, it'd become constructive, destructive on different time scales. And I'd actually be building up a different component of the picture. I'll give you an analogy. Suppose we're trying to take a picture of that mountain. We've got the broad aspects of the mountain, but we also have the trees, which are small scale. Well, with interferometry, I could take my detectors and space them really close, and I'd be sensitive to kind of the broad scales in that case. And I'd see the shape of the mountain, but I wouldn't see the trees. Or I can take my telescopes and space them really far apart, and then I'm more sensitive to the fine structure, and I'd see the trees, but not the mountains. So you build up your image component by component. You have to have all sorts of different spacings and different orientations. Otherwise, you're just making this part of the image, not this part of the image. Now, Earth rotating takes care of all the different orientations. But to get the different spacings, you have to keep moving your telescopes apart at different distances. So here's the Green Bank Interferometer. It's the first big prototype of radio interferometry. Three telescopes, and there used to be a fourth one on the mountain. Well, just with these three telescopes alone, you have three spacings. You're sampling three spacings at the same time. Here's telescope one, two, and three. Let's say two and three are close together. Because two and three are on tracks. So you can stick wherever you want to put them. You have this distance, you have this distance, and you have this distance. So with that three element interferometer, you automatically have three scales that you're sampling on. You do it with all sorts of different earth rotations to get the different orientations of the image, then you go back and move the telescopes to get other distances. And very slowly you can build up an image and it has the resolution of a telescope that's as big as the distance between the most distant elements from here to here. Again, it takes a long time to build up, but you can do it and it acts as if it's a telescope that big. So that's pretty cool. And so you can make D as big as you want by adding telescopes. But you've got to remember that you just can't have two little telescopes far away. You're going to have to build up all the scales in between. So you need the big distance and the little ones. So the next thing they built, this was the prototype effort for the VLA. So you got the Green Bank interferometer, and then you have the real deal, the VLA. Very large array. Again, we're not very creative with their acronyms. Now, you've probably seen this before. Have you seen this in any movies? Anybody? Maybe. I've seen on CNN sometimes when they're doing their little promo and flashing different images, you see some what appear to be communication satellites. It's really just an image they stole, the, the VLA. Um, I don't know if they still use that promo anymore or not, but it was in the movie Contact. If you're a sci-fi buff, it was in the movie 2010 at the beginning with the American and the, the Soviet. Anyway, here it is. It's 27 telescopes. Each of them are 80-some feet. I think they're 82 feet, a little bit smaller than the one I showed you before. And they're all on these tracks. It's a Y-shaped configuration. You can space it out to a scale of kilometers. So it acts like a radio telescope that's kilometers across. Huge. 
And with it, you can get amazing angular resolutions. You're going to look at a lot of radio pictures today. Most of them were taken with this. We take it with a small telescope. Again, it's like me taking my glasses off. Everything's blurry. But with this, you can get amazing, amazing images. Here is the compact configuration. But even in this configuration, there are all sorts of different baselines. You have from here to here, from here to there, from there to there, from there to there, etc. You also have cross-leg baselines from here to here, from here to there, from there to there. Between 27 telescopes, this configuration, I don't know, it's probably thousands of different baselines that are being hit simultaneously. Then you spread them out and you get the big ones too. And much more quickly you can piece together an image as if it were done by a telescope as big as the big space. This on the upcoming effort, this is ALMA, a very large chunk of National Science Foundation's astronomy budget is going to this effort right now. And it's, it's in the radio, it's actually in the millimeter, so really short radio. And that's the part of the electromagnetic spectrum where weather does matter, you have different elements that can make it difficult to observe. So you do want to put this very high up, it's in the Atacama Desert, high up in the Chilean Andes, at about Oh, I forget, 14,000, 18,000 feet, something like that, something crazy high up there where it's hard to breathe. And you have a whole assortment of them, and the pattern is very carefully chosen to give you all sorts of baselines without overlapping baselines. The VL, some spacings are repeated multiple times. This is a very interesting pattern. And you, know, you can move them around. It's designed to work in millimeter wavelengths, so you're opening up a new part of the electromagnetic spectrum for study, better than has been done before. You might notice I said National Science Foundation. I don't know if I've described this before. Everyone thinks astronomy is funded by NASA. Space-based astronomy is funded by NASA. Ground-based astronomy is funded primarily by the National Science Foundation. By the National Science Foundation, a big chunk of their astronomy budget, probably the biggest chunk going to any telescope, is currently going to ALMA. And it's going to do amazing science Concerning the cosmic dawn, it's going to see the gas as it's just forming the first generation of stars. And that's being constructed right now, so that's something I'm out for. It's going to be exciting. Now, you can do bigger than the VLA or ALMA. You can join telescopes from wide apart locations. Like this is called VLBA, Very Large Baseline Array. You don't have to remember this acronym, but it's basically a U.S. collaboration of radio telescopes spanning everything from Arecibo in Puerto Rico all the way to Hawaii. And they, they can't mix the signal in real time, they record it to tape and the tapes are shipped off and they do it in post-processing, but it acts as if it's a telescope as big as the U.S. or as big as the Puerto Rico to Hawaii baseline. You can join up with telescopes from other countries, it's called VLBI, Very Long Baseline Interferometer. It's the whole world. And it acts as if it's a telescope as big as the whole planet. And there are actually two of them in orbit, a Japanese radio telescope and a Russian radio telescope. So you can act with a baseline even bigger than the size of the Earth. And that kind of size telescope, you're going to have amazing um, diffraction limits or blurring scales. It's not used very much because politically it's challenging. You've got all these observatories, all these countries working together. But if there's something exciting, it's a possibility. VLBA is used more than VLBI in single telescopes or single arrays are used the rest of the time by themselves.